Hear me now? All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, God is so good. I had a meeting with the RA pastors this morning, or yeah, this morning. Yeah, it was. And I tell you what, these guys that uh, know grace and faith, they are all blessed. All of their churches have been financially blessed. They, they are just absolutely amazing. And two, a week from, two weeks from Sunday, I think, which is the 9th of August, Steve Castle is going to be back. Pastor Steve was here last year, and all of you just fell in love with him. And Steve uh, had sent uh, actually a, uh, a lawsuit against the governor of Illinois because uh, the governor of Illinois said, well, I might open a church in one to three years. He's, a, he's an atheist. He hates God. He hates the church. And so Steve took him to task and, and filed a, a federal lawsuit against him. And two or three other pastors did the same thing. Well, guess what? The uh, governor changed his mind and the churches in Illinois are open because one or two men stood their ground. And, and um, you know, of all things, I believe it's time for us, the church, to stand up, stand our ground, proclaim faith. And, and more than anything else, as Christians, our walk is more powerful than our talk. Think about it. You can walk in such a way before people that your talk means nothing to them because we are supposed to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, we're being conformed to his image and likeness. So, the church has got to come back into the place where we walk into the integrity of Christ. We walk in the fullness of who he is. We become like him. That's going to speak louder than our words. But then when we line our character up with Christ and our faith up, then the gifts are, magnif are, are just magnified. The gifts come out with purity. Prophecy comes out with purity. Power is released through the, through the laying on of hands. Power is released through the Christians to be a witness. And, uh, you know, it's just like we love our neighbors ourself. But the good thing, the thing you ought to do is I ought to call some of your neighbors and say, uh, is so-and-so a good neighbor? I think that most of you will be good neighbors. I really believe that. But, but the real measure of of whether we're really mature Christians is by our fruit, not by our works, not by the gifts and calling because they're out with, without repentance, but by our fruit. And so I believe that everybody here tonight, anybody listen to me, that I'm going to talk about grace and glory. And, uh, I want you to hear these words. I actually, these aren't original with me. I, you know, I study so many revivals that one of the revivalists, I forget who he was, back in the 1800s, he made this statement. He said, grace brings us to glory. Glory is grace fulfilled. Grace brings us to glory. The purpose of grace is so that we might be glorified with Christ. And when we are glorified, then grace is fulfilled. So I'm going to talk tonight about how grace brings us to glory, and when glory is fully revealed, then grace is fulfilled. Does that make sense to you? And, and it'll make more sense as I show you scriptures. Uh, Psalms 84, 11. It says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield... The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. That is such an awesome promise. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in thee. Think about this. It's God 
who gives us grace and glory. We don't deserve it. We didn't do anything to earn it. We don't do anything to keep it. It's, it's freely given to us. So how do we earn it? We don't. How do we get it? By grace through faith. We live by faith. It's not by works lest any man should boast. We walk by faith and faith is obedience to the word of God. If you and I are not walking in the word of God, we are not walking in grace. We're walking in mercy. There are two different things. Mercy is extended. The world right now is under mercy, not grace. They don't rec nobody receives grace until they get born again. So we're under God's mercy, the blood of the mercy seat. It's for the, the, the mercy is for the rebellious, the prideful. God's having mercy. But grace is for the faithful. Grace comes into our life when we got born again because we were saved by grace through faith. And grace is conforming us to glory. So that when glory uh, is manifested in our life, that's when grace is being fulfilled. So again, grace brings us to glory. Grace reveals glory. And glory is grace fulfilled. So when you look at this, God gives grace and glory. When we say glory, we're talking about the Shekinah glory, the manifested presence of God's glory. But we're also talking about being conformed to his image, which is glory. Now, I'm going to show you tonight how the end result of, of, of a new earth and a new, a new heaven coming is when the glory that belongs to us, his children, is, comes back to us. That's when everything comes back together. But you've got to understand something. When you and I walk by grace, grace is bringing us into glory. And glory is the essence of all that God is out of love. Love is the essence of God, but glory and grace comes out of it. When you and I are, walk in glory, we're walking into the very presence of God with us. It's different than the anointing. God can anoint this pulpit if he wanted to. God anointed a donkey to talk to Balaam. And you know, the funny thing about that truth story is Balaam wasn't shocked that a donkey was talking to him. He was so mad at that donkey, he started arguing with a donkey. He should have been shocked. Right? I'm sure he never heard a donkey talk before. But the angel of the Lord was standing in the gateway and the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and Balaam didn't. That donkey was more perceptive of the spirit realm than Balaam was. So when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, he stopped and, and you know, Balaam started beating him and everything and the donkey was talking to him and he's beating the donkey and finally the angel of the Lord appeared to him and Balaam said, Basically, he said this. I'm paraphrasing that. He says, you know what? You better thank that donkey because I was about ready to take your head off your shoulders. He had a sword. And so he basically said, you ought to be thanking that donkey. He just saved your hide. So the point I'm making is this. Balaam was an anointed prophet. But he sold his anointing for money. And he also then told, he couldn't curse. You remember the king took him, well, here, curse Israel here, I can't. He blessed him. Finally, he said, here's how you can defeat Israel. Get them to intermarry. And then start letting them worship the idols of their wife and husband. Get them, get them to intermarry. And God cursed Balaam over that. And Jesus brought that up in the book of Revelation when he was confronting one of the churches. He says, you allow Balaam. In other words, there was a false prophet there that was profiting from money. And, and Jesus said, I have this against you. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are some Balaams out there. There are some false prophets out there. You can go online and you can find a prophet and they'll say, oh, uh, for so and so much money, I'll give you a prophecy. Man, run from that with everything because two things happen. Number one, you align yourself with a false prophet. So number two, you align yourself for deception. No, but the gospel is free. 
You don't, you don't pay somebody to prophesy. The gifts and calling are there to bless people and, and manifest Christ to people. But what I'm trying to make a point is that's not the glory. Because even a uh, carnal Christian can operate in the gifts of the Spirit because they're gifts. And uh, Don Basham, most of you have never heard of him, but he wrote a, a book on this whole subject and, and, and just went in detail about the truth that just because you walk in the gifts and everything doesn't mean that, that uh, God's approving that. He's just simply the fact that the gifts are without calling. The Holy Spirit will operate. But what God is after, what I what, I, what you got to hear tonight is he wants us to transcend to glory. The Holy, the spirit of grace, grace is given to us to bring us into glory. And when glory is revealed and manifested, then grace is fulfilled. That's the work of grace. So with a crazy, quote, grace message that some people have gone clear to the extreme, they, have, they said, well, there is no hell no more. God loves everybody. He's going to restore everybody. Uh, uh, they've even gone so far, some grace people, that there's no devil. This is all, you know, God's grace. He just loves us all. That's a lie. Does he love us all? Yes. Is that grace? No. It's love that brings you into grace. Do you understand? And when you're brought into grace, immediately the Holy Spirit takes this word through a surrendered heart and conforms us into glory. I'm going to show that to you through scripture. Because glory is the very fullness and essence of Christ. The Lord of glory. And so, when I speak of grace, I am saying to you that grace doesn't let you get by with anything. That's not grace. That's mercy. But when we get filled with grace, because see, grace is only given to the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that in due season he may exalt you. Because see, we're exalted with grace to be conformed to the image of God. So grace cannot bless anything in our life that is contrary to Christ. He can't. So that's why the God who loves us, our Father, disciplines us, not with sickness, not with disease, not with tragedy. Not, God doesn't do any of that stuff. We get ourselves into those situations. And sickness is, runs rampant. I mean, that's not because you've done something wrong. But grace is how God disciplines us. And what is He disciplining? Not the spirit. He's the father of spirits. He disciplines the flesh with the word of God and the spirit of God. So that when I, Rich Van Winkle, when I'm walking in some areas of my life contrary to grace, I expect the Holy Spirit to reveal that to me. I expect my heavenly father to reveal that to me so that I can repent, and it says this, and become a partaker of his holiness. See, grace brings us to glory. Glory means we become a partaker of his holiness. Be holy as, as your God is holy. Well, that's by grace. That's awesome. Think about that. Our, our, the work of grace is bringing us into the, the, uh, to, to glory into holiness, not by an act of what we do on the outside. Some of the, the uh, holiness teachers back in the late 1800s became so law-based that you, you had to wear certain clothes, you had to fix your hair a certain way because they were having, just like the Pharisees, an outward appearance of holiness when there was an inward uh, wickedness. 
So it's not what we look like to God on the outside. He looks at the inside. And I will tell you this, that what's on the inside will reflect on the outside. Whether you're wearing a T-shirt and jeans or, or shorts or you're, it doesn't matter unless it's, you know, it, it should not be, um, what would I say? It should be modestly. Uh, you know, you don't run around in bikinis, ladies, and guys don't run around in their Speedos. That's not right. You understand what I'm saying? You just erase that out of your brain real quick. But the thing is, to dress down like we do uh, has nothing to do with holiness. Holiness is re that we reflect God. It's an inward reality that, that manifests in our life, and that's by grace manifesting glory. Am I making sense to you? And it's not anything we can do other than to surrender and say, yes, Lord. And it's a loving relationship with God that says that we, if we keep his commandments, we love him. Now, what is See, you can turn that into law. Well, I've got to keep his commandments. Well, you don't love him if you have to do that. You do it because you love him. Not to, not to get his love, but you love him so much, why would you want to disobey him? That's the principle. Why would you not want to keep the word of the one who loves you? Jesus said, I kept the Father's commandments and it proved that I loved him because of that. But see, the law will come along and say, if you don't keep God's commandments, he doesn't love you. Well, that's not true. And yet he said, those who keep my commandments love me. Is there a contradiction? No. Here's the truth. Because I love him, why would I want to disobey him? When it's by the commandments that we are blessed. It's by the promises of God in Christ Jesus where we find our yes and amen. The word of God is there to bless us, not curse us. The word of God is there to bless us with grace, not bring us into bondage of the law. Do this and don't do that. Am I, am I, grace brings me to the place that I, oh, I only want to do the do's. I don't want to worry about the don'ts. I just want to do the do's because grace is in me for that to happen. Now, there is a old sin nature that is on the cross, but once in a while he shows up. I know he doesn't in your life, but every once in a while he shows up in my life and he doesn't want to do the do's. Especially when God says, do this, and I don't want to do that, Lord. And it's okay. God doesn't mind. It's like the parable of the two sons. And the father went to the first son and he said, go out and plow the field. He says, yes, father, I'm going to go plow that field. And he didn't do it. So he goes to the second son and says, go out and plow that field. And he said, I don't want to plow that field, dad. I just don't want to do it. But he sat there and he got to thinking about it. He's like, you know what? That's not right. So he went out and plowed the field. And Jesus said, which one of these two did the will of the father? It was the one that repented and went out and did his will. A lot of Christians promise to do God's will, and never do it. God, I'll, I'll, it's like a New Year's resolution. God, I'll pray more. God, I'll read my Bible more. God, I'll do this more. And you know you're not going to. You know why? You're trying to do it by works. And then the cycle comes in and you get condemned. That's not grace. That's law. And the law brings a curse. But Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By hanging on a tree. Because cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That we might receive the promise of Abraham, which is the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of grace conforms us to the glory and image of God. Am I making sense? So I'm not talking about that we're going to be perfect every minute of every day of all of our life. But we can be perfected. We can be willing to let grace have its work in our life so that glory can begin to fill us. The image of Christ can begin to fill us. When we miss God, like Pastor Dwayne says, when we do a piece of stupid, 
That's the time to run to God, not from God. Because here's how you run from God. You try and work it by your own strength to do something to prove to God that you love him. And you can't do it. He loves you, period. Doesn't matter what you do. He loves the lost sinners. God is love. But not everybody embraces his love. So I'm trying to encourage you in something. God's not expecting us to be perfect, but yet if we will yield to him, he then will perfect us. So from that viewpoint, when Jesus says, be holy as your father is holy, he's not saying you can do it in your own strength. He's saying that the grace of God will make us holy. So see, grace will not let you sin. In fact, it says, Sin no longer has dominion over you. You ought to read the scriptures in Romans where Paul said that, you know, some of you are saying, oh, now I know how to get grace. I'll sin more. And Paul said, God forbid. Have you not learned that you are dead to sin? Sin no longer has dominion over you. That which is born of God cannot sin. And grace then gives us the power to walk in freedom from sin. Praise God. That is good news. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of grace. But grace is bringing us into glory. And when glory is, is, is manifested, grace is fulfilled. I want to... Turn to the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians. This is so good. Thanks be to God. It always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. We don't triumph in our own strength. We triumph in his strength. It says this in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Well, let's, I'm going to go to verse 13. Paul says this, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel. I want you to hear these words to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have been called according to the gospel of grace, to obtain the glory of Jesus Christ. You see that? That's good news. That's awesome news. That's the best news you'll ever hear. That we have obtained salvation through Jesus Christ, sanctified by the Spirit and believing in the truth. For what purpose? To obtain the glory of Jesus Christ. To obtain all that he is. Because all humanity has sinned and fallen short of the, listen to the words, of the glory. It's all about man fell short of the glory. And God is now saying, no, I'm going to restore, I have restored that glory to you. And I've given you my spirit of grace. I have sanctified you. I've given you my word so that you can obtain my glory by grace. Is that awesome? This, I hope this picture is, paints something on the inside of you. Every Christian should, should uh, absolutely know what their future is. God has a plan and a future for you. Well, here's your future. You're being conformed to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an awesome future. That's an eternal future. I'll give you another scripture. Jude 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jude. I bet you didn't find Jude doing that. All right, where are we here? It is... Um, here it is. It's on page 1527. <laughs> it's just... Revelation. (laughs) 
I was just trying to help Rose find the scripture, you know, how that goes. Look at verse 24. This is so awesome. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. The word falling there means to stumble. Not fall away from salvation, but to stumble along the way. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. Let me show you something, Christians. I want you to hear me. You and I are not responsible to keep someone else from falling. That is not our responsibility. Because if we assume that responsibility, we take the place of the Holy Spirit, and then we will judge people, and judgment don't help anybody from falling. And here's the other thing. When someone falls, it's not up us to tell him why and where he fell. It's not our business. Now, if someone could come and talk to you or they talk to me as a pastor and say, you know, they ask you, where did I go wrong? And I could say, well, what did you do? And they'll tell me what they did. And I say, well, that's where you went wrong. You know what I'm saying? But let me show you how to walk when what's right. Because Jesus is the one who's able to keep us from falling and stumbling. And listen to the next verse. And, um, to present you faultless. We're not here to point out each other's faults. You know the old thing, you point a finger, there's three pointing back at you. Any one of us in this room have a fault in one way or another in our life. We're being perfected, we're being changed. But it's not up to me to go and find the fault in other people because that's easy. Some of us wear our faults real, real uh, out in the open. But it's, it's the Lord himself who presents you faultless. Now, what does he present you to? Listen to these words. Before the presence of his glory with exalted exceedingly joy. You can't come into the presence of God's glory and not be joyful. Amen. The joy of the Lord's our strength. And, and, and his presence is fullness of joy. So what glory does, bring us, grace brings us into glory, into the fullness of joy, but it's the Lord himself who does it. I'll read this again. Now unto him, that's our God. He's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding glory to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and evermore. Amen and amen. Thanks be to God. What God has given the responsibility of the body of Christ is, is not to, to try and present somebody blameless. It's not us to keep somebody from falling. It's us to operate in our gifts and calling to equip and build up the body of Christ. That's what we do. That's what the gifts within us does. That's the more I become more like Jesus, more filled with glory, I can help you be mature by the gifting that's in me. By those gifts that's in there is to build up the body of Christ. The gift that we're called to is to build the body of Christ. We gather together to consider one another how we might stir somebody up to, to love and good works. You know, the church has been notorious, notorious for stirring people up. I mean, I've been stirred up by the best. Not to good works and love, believe me. We're not to mess and stir people. We're, we're to stir them up. Like Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that's within you. We are here to stir up the gift within each other, to set it on fire, not to, not to put it out by our law-based, well, you just judgment. Listen, if you see somebody doing wrong, the Bible says pray for them. Pray for them before you ever say anything, because usually if you pray long enough, you'll keep your mouth shut. We're to be slow to speak, quick to hear. And most of us are quick to speak and slow to hear. 
Sometimes we say things that a little bit later we wish we'd never said it because we weren't slow to hear. We were quick to speak. And if we're slow to hear and allow the Lord to conform us to his image and likeness, it says, then our words will be seasoned with salt and impart grace to the ears of the hearer. And if you say something to somebody and it doesn't impart grace to them, you're out of order. It's you, not the Holy Spirit speaking through you. If when you say something to somebody and it offends them or condemns them, that's not God. Now, if I say something that might correct somebody with love, that's a whole different story because it will impart grace. How pleasant are sweet words to the ears of the hearer. I learned this years ago with my son. My son is like me. And him and I were kind of button heads when he's a senior in high school. And he's getting mad at me and I get mad at him. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, he said, you know, your son is just like you. If somebody pushes you in a corner, you're going to fight. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, he thrives on encouragement. Encouraging. Because I was telling him everything he shouldn't be doing. I, he came home that night and we were at the place we wouldn't even look at each other in the house. We were so mad. And I was weeping and I kissed him on the cheek and I said, son, I want you to forgive me for being angry with you. I promise you I'll never be angry with you again. And I never have been. And from that moment on, all I did was encourage him. And he thrived on it. And he still does. He still does. We have to learn how to impart grace to another person. And the only way we can do that is to live in grace, live in glory, so that we'll know by the Spirit how to help somebody else move into grace. Am I making sense to you? You try and push somebody into grace on your own strength and you're going to offend them. You're going to hurt them. You're going to make them mad. And the other thing is, some people aren't ready for truth yet. And if you try and give somebody truth, they're going to get mad at you. Because they're not ready for it. Jesus said very plainly to his own disciples, I have more to say to you, but you can't receive it right now. Because they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. He knew when they could receive what he wanted to impart to them. And he knew they could only happen when they received the Holy Spirit. So a lot of people not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to know when to keep your mouth shut. Because they're not ready to hear truth yet. All they want is love. Just love them. Just love them. And I guarantee you, God will begin to touch their hearts. God can show you when to say something and when, when to not say something. That's being led by the Holy Spirit. I mean, all of us are there. I mean, there's times I just want to call somebody out and just ring. I mean, man, just ring their neck. But I have to go before the Lord and let the Lord settle that down. Show me how much he loves that person. He loves them as much as he loves me. I'm not his favorite. Neither are any of you. He's no respecter of persons. Just let you know. But he is so intimately, personally involved with each of us. Each one of us feel like we're his favorite. And that's a gift of God. I don't know how he does it, but he does. You could probably ask any Christian that really loved the Lord. Say, oh, I'm his favorite. I'm the apple of his eye. And you are. And so is 10 million others. Are you getting me? And so we need to learn to walk in love. And how do we do that? Uh, we, we submit to the one who's able to present us to himself. And present us before his glory. That's awesome. Second Corinthians 318. Just think about it now. I'm gonna tell you something. Look up the word personified. Anybody know what the word personified means? It means this, because I looked it up yesterday. I've looked it up before, but it means this, that we actually take on the personality of a, of a, 
an entity or of God or some, we actually take their personality. That's personified. That's one person personified in another person and they become one. They become just like each other. Am I making sense? That's what personified means. Well, Christ is being personified in us. It's like Paul said, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who liveth in me. If you then be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above. Why? Because you have died. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you'll appear with him in glory. There's that word glory again. So it's up to the Lord to present us to himself. And here's the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're familiar with this, but I want to show you in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, but we all, all who, all who have received Christ, read the rest of the scriptures ahead of time, the veil's been removed. We've entered into the Holy of Holies with Christ so that all of us Christians, all who had the veil removed and we've come to Christ with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. The word glass, there's mirror. It's like looking in the reflection of a mirror and seeing the glory of the Lord. Well, who are you seeing? That's what my book is. As he is, so are we. I have a picture of my son looking to a mirror, but he sees Jesus. That's what this scripture is telling us. That we are reflecting like in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. You notice it says the glory of the Lord. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Why? Because grace brings us to glory and glory is grace fulfilled. So, that we all are changed or being transformed, metamorphosized. It's the same word that says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Same word, metamorphosized. Being changed from the, you know, the little caterpillar to the butterfly. And do you know that, when, that that's the only creature they know of that has a DNA change? The caterpillar, when it becomes a butterfly... The butterfly has a different DNA. It's the only one, that's the only creature that happens to. So what is it? That's a picture of being born again. That's why God did that. So when we get born again, we have another DNA. It's God. We have the DNA of God. So we're being transformed into the same image. What image? The image of the glory of the Lord. From what? From glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. The literal Greek says, even by the Lord's Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also the Lord. The Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Spirit. They're one. And this whole context here says that when those turn to the Lord, and he says, I speak of the Spirit, who is the Lord? So the Holy Spirit is our Lord also. And you follow in scripture sometimes when they say, Lord, the early church, they're talking to the Holy Spirit, not Jesus. They knew him as Lord. We need to know him as Lord. Our Lord and our friend and our comforter and our counselor, the one who ever liveth in us, make an intercession, changing us from glory to glory into the image of the glory of the Lord. Is that awesome? This is the work of grace. This is the grace of the spirit of grace, conforming us into the image of the glory of the Lord, into the image of Christ. Man, church, this is powerful. Philippians 3, verse 20. Is this blessing you? I've only been meditating on this for 40 years. And I just learned something new when I heard it from that one revivalist that said, grace brings us to glory, glory is grace fulfilled. And man, I started meditating on that and that's exactly right. If Philippians chapter three, verse 20 says, for our conversation, now the, this is the King James, that's, this is our manner of life, is in heaven. Another translation says, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Who shall change our vile, our earthly body, 
that it may be fashioned into the, his glorious body. That word glorious body, the, the literal Greek says, into the body of his glory. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That working is the Holy Spirit who's conforming us into the image of the glory of the Lord. Is that, is that making sense to you? Now, back up to Romans 8. Am I, have I convinced you by the word of God yet that you're being conformed to the image of the glory of the Lord? And that God bestows upon us grace and glory? And, and uh, Psalms 8 says, who is this little feeble man that you're mindful of him? Yet you have made him a little lower than yourself, than Elohim, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. And then we read in Psalms 84, 11, God, God bestows upon us grace and glory. Now, this is what happened when Adam fell from grace. Verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said that all that he suffered, he called them slight, slight afflictions. Well, let's see, he was beaten five times with the 39 lashes. He was beaten with rods. He was put in chains in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was rejected. He was stoned to death. And Paul said, these are light afflictions. We get a headache and think we're afflicted. Church, we, we don't have a clue what real afflictions for the gospel is all about. We just don't. Thank God. I'm not ready to be beaten yet. Now, if I had to, I would, but I probably wouldn't like it. But Paul said that, listen to this. He says, put it in context, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Other translation says to us. So whatever we go through on earth in suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ, which we Americans have not got there yet, but it, they want to do that to us. But Paul says the comparison of what happens to us on earth doesn't even compare to the glory, to the glory that's going to be revealed in us and to us. Then it says, for the earnest expectation of the creature, creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by the reason of him who has subjected it, the same in hope. Now, I want to show you this. When Adam fell, the glory of God fell and all of creation stopped. All of creation fell. Why? Because God said, I've given man dominion over the works of my hands. So when Adam fell, all of creation fell. All of it. That's what's being said here. Why? Because the glory of God was no longer resonant with man. And, but it's been subjected in hope. Here's what the hope is. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, again, here's what the Greek says. Unto the liberty of the glory of the children of God. A lot of times when you see glorious, it's, it's glory. It's in glory. So that when the glory of God is again given back to man fully, then all of creation will be set free and we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. It's the liberty of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the, the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, now listen to this, to wit, 
the redemption of our body. And I just read that in Philippians, that the day will come, we'll have the body of glory like Jesus. And when that happens, that's when redemption is complete. And that's when, for we are saved by hope. But what hope that is seen is not hope, but what is a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? And so the whole, the whole thing goes on and tells us that our hope is for the glory of the Lord to be restored to us. And when that happens, all of creation will be delivered from corruption and there'll be a new heaven and new earth. And when does that happen? It happens when we receive the body of glory, when our body is glorified. That's when it happens. Because then we're just like Jesus, the Lord of glory. Then God will begin to dissolve this earth, burn it up with fire and the whole, and then create a new heaven and a new earth. Sin originated in heaven, not on the earth. Think about it. Lucifer was in heaven when he sinned against God. So even heaven now has to be purged by the blood of the lamb. So there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Is that awesome? So anyway, this is how important you and I are to the welfare of the world and the universe. And that's why the grace of God is bringing us into glory. And when glory is complete, then grace is fulfilled. And it won't be complete until we have the redeemed, resurrected body of glory, just like Jesus. But let me show you the magnitude of this in Acts chapter 4, because we got to look at, well, how does that apply? How, how do we, number one, first thing is our character changes. Our attitudes change. We get filled with the word of God. We get filled with the spirit of God. We become like Christ. But then as we are being conformed into that glory, the glory realm begins to dwell on earth. And that's what happened in the book of Acts. I'll give you a picture of it. Acts chapter four and verse 31. And this is when they were threatened by the Sanhedrin, the apostles said, don't you dare teach or preach in the name of Jesus anymore. So they went to, their, to the people, told them, they prayed. Now it says this, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know, the Holy Spirit was so excited. He said the amen by shaking that place. And when you study out shaking in the Bible, earthquakes in the Bible, it's because of the presence of God. The presence of God was so powerful because listen, the Holy Spirit was, was right now, all right, is my church going to compromise or is my church going to be bold? Are they going to cave in? Are they going to say no? Well, thank God they said no. Lord, you look at, but you grant us boldness to speak your word. And when they said that, the Holy Spirit confirmed the amen by shaking that place with his presence. They were all filled with the spirit again and they spoke the word of God boldly. What happened then? Verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed, that's mean all the believers were of one heart and one soul. This is what's coming back to the body of Christ. The divisions of the body of Christ are coming to an end. The great Holy Ghost is going to shake us place with his glory. And the body of Christ, the body of Christ is going to have one heart, and one soul. And that's the heart and soul of God. He's bringing it. It's going to happen because this is what happens when glory is manifest. The other thing that happens is you don't get by with anything. Ask Ananias and Sophia. Your flesh won't boast in the presence of God because you don't want to. Now watch this. So here they are. They're of one heart. They're of one soul. And, and um, 
It says this then. It says they, they had everything in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Now watch this. Grace and power equals glory. When you see grace and power working together, you're seeing the Shekinah glory of God manifested. That word grace there, accompanied with power, means this. A manifestation of the divine presence, activity, power, and glory of God. Great grace was upon the church. Great power. What the, the Shekinah glory was resting on the church. God's manifested glory presence, Shekinah, was upon the church. That's why we lack in power. Because we lack being filled with grace. Which means we're, we become filled with glory. What did it look like? Acts chapter 5, verse 14. Here's God's model of evangelism when the church is glorified, when grace and power, the Shekinah glory is flowing through the church and is resting upon the church. Here's what it looks like. Verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. You notice it didn't say it was added to the church. It wasn't added to the shepherd's house. It, wasn't, it was added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Now, here's an interesting question. Why did it say men and women? Because at that time, women were looked down upon. And they weren't included in men's activities. But God is saying here, no, this is both men and women. This is, not a, this is not a man's world. It's, the, it's Christ's world. Am I making sense? So you, you, you sisters in the Lord, you have just equal stand with anybody in Christ. Amen. God doesn't have any second class citizens. And then it says, multitudes were added unto the Lord in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter might overshadow some of them. The word overshadow there is the glory of God overshadowing the tabernacle. And literally what this is saying is Peter and the church was overshadowed with the glory of God. And it was within that glory bubble that everybody was being healed. It says that they, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. That's what it's going to look like in this glory revival. That's what it's going to look like as the, the, the church is being restored back into glory. So that here, I believe this with all my heart, we get our new parking lot in. I just see it lined with people then get saved and healed right out on the parking lot. Can you see the hospitals bringing sick folks over here and they're healed? Why? Because of the glory of God that's resting upon us. That's what we're headed into, church. That's, what, that's power and grace working together. That's the Shekinah glory. That's what's not only going to happen here, it's going to happen throughout the church, throughout the whole earth. That's the only way we can make disciples of all nations, by the glory of God upon the church. Where there's no division, there's no strife, there's no flesh that can boast in it. Rick Joyner had a vision in 1989 of the end times of the glory. And he said he saw ministries that were out of the will of God. And he saw them, even large ministries, they fell on their face and repented because they had moved away from God's purpose and their ministry then exploded out of the ashes of repentance. And then he said there were those who would not repent. And he said, I saw pulpits where pastors died, prophet, died in the pulpit because they were resisting the glory of God. That's the magnitude of glory. 
That's the magnitude of what can happen when the glory is more and more manifest. Thank God he does it little by little. But when the manifestation of glory comes, that's grace fulfilled. We will see this again worldwide. It'll include every born again Christian because that's what grace does. Brings us into the presence and the glory realm of God. That's where we're headed. That's what's happening to us. That's why we can build each other up in love. And the more and more of the glory that's manifested with us, more and more of flesh will die. And the Lord spoke to me years when I founded this church. He said, it'll be a place for the flesh to die and the spirit to live. That's an awesome thing. That is so awesome. Amen.